Okay, guys, be quiet now. Let's resume with the discussion. The objective now is uh, I'm trying to go as fast as possible to get you guys up to speed with the uh, with whatever has to be done. So you might feel that some of the coverage, some of the material that has been covered, you might feel that it's not in sequence or anything like something like that. But the objective is at this point to quickly give you whatever you need to operate and do the project. Okay, so that is why we are covering whatever we are covering. Okay, so. Um, Let's go back to the Rajesh. ये इनको बोलना कि आवाज ना करे बाहर इतना ये कौन है? इनको निकाल दीजिए बस. Okay, guys, let's get back to the technical notes. See what which parts. Okay, so where we left off yesterday, we were discussing. Uh, actually, we went down all the way to the section on basis risk. And in our discussion on, we started our discussion. Okay, guys, please no talking. Okay, be quiet. So we started our discussion of outright position versus spread positions. And to do that, we went into the section on basis risk. Is everyone clear about these two ideas? Outright versus basis. Outright, sorry, outright versus spread. Okay, let's go down. Yeah, so we go down here. So let's try and understand a few more points here. So uh, we gave the example yesterday of the airline that is. So what is the natural position of an airline with respect to jet fuel? Short. 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 Okay. So the natural position or underlying position, or sometimes people call it a structural position, is short in the case of uh, an airline. They're short jet fuel. So one of the things they might do as a hedge is to buy crude oil futures. Okay. In which case, that now if you look at their net position, okay, including the natural underlying position plus the hedge position. Okay. When you look at the net position, it is. Now short jet fuel and long crude oil. Okay, we won't talk, we won't mention the word futures, but long crude oil. Okay, so actually in this case, what they have is a spread position. Okay, but to be more specific and to understand the nature of the spread position, what are they? What do you think they are? Short or long the spread? If we define the spread, let's go into a spreadsheet so we don't have to uh, use the board, and we can capture it here. Let's go into your calc file. All right, so let's create a new sheet. Okay, so let's just, uh, I'll just create a new sheet, then later on I'll name it. And so this sheet is already sh shared with you. And then let's just try to understand this position, okay? So. Okay, so short, we start out being short. I'm just gonna write it as JF, okay? JF is for jet fuel and long. I'm gonna just write CL for the West Texas contract. So everyone, is everyone okay with this? So the position is short JF and long uh, uh, crude oil, okay? And in particular, what we are going to say is that the airline is, we say that airline is, um, we'll see whether they are long or short the spread okay so the airline has a spread position okay uh, we'll see whether they are long or short the spread first we have to define the spread the spread is defined as um, yeah so we will just define the spread as JF minus CL okay so that means so let's say if the JF price is say uh, 85 and then the crude oil price is 80 so the spread is five okay so again we are going to use the same logic that we used earlier with respect to underlying positions okay so let's write, just write this here as jf and this is cl and this is our spread okay or we can call it s position sp for spread position okay so this is what we have now let's just uh, copy this down a little bit all right now let's say so what we have to now determine is so it is not sufficient or not sufficiently elegant to say that the screw then allies spread position is short jet fuel and long crude oil we need to be able to say in a more elegant way we are going to have to say either whether they're short the jet fuel crude oil spread or they're long the spread okay so we have to first define the spread you can also define it as cl minus jf it's up to you but we have but you have to be consistent once you define it in a particular way you have to be consistent okay 
So we are defining the spread as JF minus CL. So now we are required to make a statement to be very specific. Then we have to say what is this airline's position because they were naturally short jet fuel. They bought crude oil futures as a hedge. So now we are saying they have a spread position and we have defined the spread already. So only thing that, the only thing that remains for us to do is to specify whether this airline's position in the spread. Now the spread is like a market. Just like dollar yen is a market. Okay, uh, Microsoft common stock is a market. Now the spread becomes like a market. So with respect to the spread, now we have to make a statement whether this airline is short or long. Okay, so what do you think guys? Is it short or long? The spread. Use the same logic that we asked you to use for your underlying position, determining the underlying position. What did we say Saudi Arabia's underlying position with respect to crude oil is what? Long. 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 Why is it long? What is the logic? But the price of the fuel is increasing and they are completed. They are holding, back. They are holding the share price and the price of the fuel is increasing. That's why they are long. No, no, no. That, that's not the complete logic. What is the complete logic? Yes, Gawa, you want to try? What is it? Everyone knows Saudi Arabia's uh, structure. Uh, US, uh, US is restricted. So they are uh, always in surplus of crude oil. No, 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 no. That's so not the logic. Holding their position as the price of the no, 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 no. You, again, the way, this is what you have to remember. That's what I mean by understanding concepts. What is the question? The question is, Saudi, what is Saudi Arabia's uh, underlying position with respect to crude oil? Everyone knows the answer is long, but you have to give the justification. That should be very simple. Everyone should have got it right. We discussed it yesterday. Why is, the, why is this uh, position assessed to be long? Because we see that when the price goes up, they benefit. And when the price goes down, they lose money. When the price goes up, they make money, and the price when the price goes down, they lose money. So this is how the logic should be given when you ask this question. That we see that we know that Saudi Arabia, when when the price of oil goes up, they will benefit, and when the price of oil falls, they will lose money. So what is the type of position that behaves like that? Long, long, long position. The short position is not going to behave like that. It's only the long position that will behave this way. That when the market goes up, you make money, and when the market goes down, you lose money. So only a long position behaves like that. Therefore, their underlying position must be long. This is clear, like a math proof. You have to remember it logically, okay? We already discussed this logic. This is very important to understand so that in any future case where you're given any particular underlying position, you ask the question, okay, what is Japan's underlying position with respect to crude oil? So you need to have some contextual knowledge, obviously. You need to know whether Japan is a net importer or a net exporter. But then, the way you figure it out, in terms of the final answer is this logic that I have given. Is this clear? Okay. Alright, so now let's apply the same logic. So this logic is very important. You can use it in every kind of situation to figure out the position. So now the question is, we come back to this question of uh, what is the under what is the spread position that this uh, airline has uh, with respect to the jet fuel crude oil spread as we have defined it. Are they short the spread or are they long the spread? Short. So this apply this logic. Short the spread. Short the spread. Asking me or telling me? Telling. Telling me. Okay. Why? Why are they short the spread? Because they are long to oil, but it is not exactly. I have already given you the logic. It's just simple. It's like a math. Once you learn some procedures in maths, how did you learn maths in school? You were taught how to multiply matrices. We will use your brain every time. No, you already know the procedure. Once you see these in a particular pattern, you just apply the logic. So when the right. price increases, uh, they will take a loss and when the price drops, they will... Uh, okay, and in this case, what is the price? How have we defined the price here? Jet fuel. Jet fuel. No, no, no. Because what is the market that we are talking about? We are, we are talking about the spread. Now the question is with respect to the spread market. Because their position is in the spread. They no longer have an outright position in jet fuel or in crude oil. They have a spread position. So the question that I'm asking is with respect to the spread. So the market itself is now the spread. It's as if you go here. It's as if you go here. See, you can see the difference between the two prices. The difference is not constant. Okay, it's as if you took a measure of the difference at each point. There are so many data points at this time series chart, right? So as if you recorded the difference in each at each point and then remove the blue line and the red line and separately do a, drew a green line just representing the difference. Are you following what I'm saying? Okay. You can do a separate green line, forget the blue and the red, just take the blue minus red difference and plot it as a green line on the same time scale. Right? 
So that is now we are talking about that market. We are talking about that green line spread market. Okay. So the question is again back to the uh, to the spread market. What is this airline's position now in the spread market? Are they short the spread or long the spread? Short. Short. Why? Sorry. Okay, so let's see your scenario. Let's work out the scenario that Nancy is talking about. So let's say we start with this position, okay? Let's say they bought the jet fuel. Let they were let's say that they were short at 85, okay? Typically, we will assume where does this number come from? There will be an estimate every airline when they're doing their budgeting for the upcoming year. They will make a budget. They will assume that our purchase price for the upcoming year. Okay, when they're doing a cost budget, they will assume that our upcoming uh, cost uh, year's cost is going to be on average $85. So we are assuming that it's going to be in barrels. It's not actually in barrels, but we are making it the same unit to make it simpler. So they are going to assume that our this has come out of the cost budget. Okay, we are so therefore we are short jet fuel at 85 because if we have if we have to buy at anything higher than 85, then our budgets are going to go for a six. Okay, because we have already budgeted 85. So if we can buy at 85 or better, are you guys following this logic? Yes. So there's another thing that you can understand about corporate risk management. Okay, typically you will make a budget. Every company has to make a budget, right? So when they make a budget, they will make an assumption. Every country, even in India, when you make the, uh, the country's budget, the union budget, the government has factored in a price for crude oil. When they are making the estimate, when Mr. Chetri is presenting the budget in Parliament, in that budget, there are assumptions about the crude oil price. Okay, because it's a forward-looking exercise. Okay, so it's a, there's a number. So every company will have an assumption about the uh, budgeted uh, purchase price. So the airline, when it's making this budget, that 85 number has come from their cost budgeting for the next year okay so they have assumed that they are going to buy 85 so that means they are short anyway they are short the natural position is short now the question is short at what price they are short at 85 because they have assumed 85 so if they can buy it below 85 then they are well okay because the budget is okay but if they have to buy at prices higher than 85 then the budget is going for a cost because you are now over budget costs are over budget that's not a good situation right you following okay so that's where we have come from now we're going back to Mansi's scenario so that and then they hedge the crude oil and they bought the crude oil futures at 80 dollars a barrel okay so now what we see is now Mansi is saying that let's say this has gone up by 10 dollars but the crude oil has gone up only by seven dollars okay so think about it what will happen now now think about the components of the spread there are two components short jet fuel and long crude oil okay so now how much is how much are we going to lose on the short jet fuel position ten dollars ten dollars we are losing on the short jet fuel position okay and then here how much are we going to make seven seven okay so here therefore what is happening is so we are only making seven dollars on the hedge position so now you should start looking at the two components the underlying position and the hedge position on the underlying position you are losing ten dollars and on the hedge position you are making only seven dollars so net are you losing or making no. you are losing three dollars right okay so what have we seen here now what has happened to the spread now look at the spread position value the spread has increased okay so what are we observing the question was we are our focus was already on the spread as a market we are now looking at the spread itself as a market okay the question is whether we are short or long that market okay so what we find is that when that market price of the spread goes from five to eight we are losing money right so then what must be the position in the spread or short that means we are short the spread okay is everyone clear about the logic now yes okay all right so this is how you have to figure out so now we say that the airline so now we have to understand basically that what what do we mean by a spread position this is a spread position okay that you are short, you are short jet fuel long crude oil, so actually you are short the jet fuel crude oil spread. Okay. So you are short, so if the spread rises, yeah. if the spread widens, that means the crude oil the jet fuel rises more than crude oil, you will lose money. Okay, otherwise you will make money. Okay. So this is what, what you have to understand. So is everyone clear now about the difference what we mean by spread positions and what do we mean by outright positions? Okay, so each of those things, 
a short KF is an outright position, long CL on its own is an outright position. But when you combine the two, that becomes a spread position. Okay, and you have to define the spread in a particular way. Okay, either CL minus JF or JF minus CL. And then you figure out this is better, actually a better way to do it is to do JF minus CL. And here you actually short the spread. The hairline is short the spread. Okay, what we are Yeah, you have to be consistent. You know, once you assume something JF, you can't keep changing the definition of the spread all the time. Spread position is equivalent to underlying asset position. Uh, it is also yeah. the What do you mean by that? The spread position is short over here, and yeah. the asset position is also short. No, don't assume that. Don't make that connection. Don't write that as an axiom or uh, you know one principle. Okay, because depending on how you define the spread, depending on how the different in a different situation you might define the spread differently. So don't look at it that way. Don't don't you know don't need to make that additional assumption that the spread position is equal to the underlying position. But that may not always hold true. What you have to remember is this basic logic that whenever you have to figure out whether the uh, position in a particular market, that market could be an underlying position market or it could be a spread position market. Okay, whatever your in any market, okay, however defined, whether your position is long or short, the way you are going to figure it out is to figure out whether when the market price rises, are you losing money or making money? If you're losing money, that means your position must be short. Okay, and you can double check that to see that when, you're, when the price drops, you're making money. Clear? Okay. So now the thing is that the, why are we making this distinction between? Uh, let me just check if this is there in your notes. Okay, we'll check that later. If it's not there, I'll just write it. Essentially. So okay, what do you think? Let me ask you this question. Do you think the airline is better off? Have a look at this chart, okay? Have a look at this chart. From this chart, you can see since about four, four and a half past, four to four and a half years of data, okay? From this chart, you have a sense of just look at the movements in the jet fuel price, okay? Over this four and a half year period, okay? Have a look at the focus on the blue line, that is the jet fuel price. And then imagine, okay, we haven't done this, we have to do this exercise, but Imagine that at each point you are taking the difference, okay, noting down the difference and then plotting the difference as a green line, okay, or whatever color you want to use. So, yeah, okay, first thing is you focus on the, how, how, uh, how volatile is the, is the crude oil, is the jet fuel price, okay, get a sense of it, we are not looking at the actual number. The actual number is very simple, you would just take the standard deviation of a series, okay. You already know how to do standard deviation, yes. so you would just have if you don't if you had the data. We don't have the numbers actually with us, but if we had the data, we would just run a standard deviation on that blue line. Okay, that would give you a proxy for the volatility of the series. Okay, so now imagine. So first part is clear. Okay, the second exercise is now imagine that at each point you're noting the difference between the blue line and the red line. Okay, basically the spread. At each point you're noting down the spread. Okay, keeping a record of the spread and then you are plotting that spread on the same time axis. Okay, it's a little bit of a little bit of imagination required, but you are you are you understand what I'm saying? No, 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 no moving at it. At each point you just perform this exercise. At each point, like if you see here, somewhere here, the difference is whatever, like if I take it here, this the crude oil price is one forty dollars and this is one eighty dollars. Okay. So if I'm plotting the value for this point for the spread, what is the value of the spread for this? Is forty dollars. So here I will plot forty. So this plot will be here. Okay. Here it's much narrower, so it's like maybe ninety dollars, and this is one o five. Okay. So then, or maybe one ten. Okay. So ninety to one. So this is fifteen dollars. So for this time time period, this will be plotted as fifteen dollars. Are you following? Okay. In this manner, we can also plot on the same scale on the same chart. We can also plot, plot the spread between the jet fuel and the crude oil price. Are you guys following what I'm saying? Everyone following what I'm saying? Okay. Bye bye. Are you following? Okay. What? I have doubt. Uh, so if you have a doubt, you have to ask. You have to ask me. Why? Why? Why do I have to look at your face and see that you're not 100% convinced? Yes. What is the doubt? It's clear now. Earlier. Okay. Okay. Now it's clear. Okay. So there are two series that we are considering. First, we focus on the jet fuel price, okay, and we try to assess how volatile that price is, okay. 
and then uh, we are looking, imagining that we have a spread position, I mean that we have a spread price plot as well. So we can take the difference between the blue line and the red line and plot it as a separate line. Okay. So my question to you now is that if higher, now in finance in general, uh, we use volatility as a measure of risk. Okay. I personally think there are better ways to measure risk, but that is a very well, uh, that's a very well accepted definition. So you can you can go with that to start with. So volatility is a measure of risk, and you can just take volatility as standard deviation. Okay. All right. So a standard deviation of the series uh, is a little more detailed, but we can just take standard deviation as a as an initial understanding. So if if volatility as measured by standard deviation is a is a measure of risk. Okay. So what did you see in the situation? You saw that the initially the company had a short position in jet fuel okay by virtue of being in the airline business then what the company did was they hedged it by buying crude oil futures okay so my question is do you think the company and now what do they have they actually have a spread position it's not that they don't have any position at all or any risk they have a spread position okay so uh, now do you think that the company's risk has actually reduced as a result of the hedge like initially when they, so my question, another way of framing the question is, which position is riskier? The short jet fuel position or the short spread position? You saw that they had two positions, right? Initially when they did nothing to hedge, they had a short jet fuel position. So one of the options they had was, let's not hedge. Let's just keep it like the way it is, okay? Let's not hedge. That's one of you, no one's gonna put you in jail if you don't hedge, okay? So it's just that you're running some kind of risk. Okay. So that's one option that they have. They don't hedge at all. And the other option that they have is that they hedge fully with crude oil futures. Okay. The entire volume of purchases for next year, let's say whatever they're buying, say thousand barrels. Okay. So the four thousand barrels they have hedged using crude. Uh, uh, let's say it's a bigger number. Let's say hundred thousand barrels. So they hedge all of that with crude oil futures contracts. Okay. So they're hundred percent hedge. So we are looking at two options: hundred percent hedge versus zero hedge. Okay. So which position is riskier? Oh, so zero hedge. How will you measure? See, what did we say? We are, uh, my question is, which position is riskier? Sir, S is jet class. Which is short jet fuel position. Yeah, which is riskier? The first one. The first one. So the is saying the first, the jet fuel price, uh, the volatility of the, I mean, the risk, uh, the short jet fuel position is riskier. Okay. So this, this this answer can be given in a very, I'm not saying he's right or anything, but if you want to frame the question, it's very simple now because I've already told you what is the measure of risk. Okay, we said that volatility is a measure of risk and standard deviation is a proxy for volatility. Okay, so then since we have, if we imagine that we have the data, okay, we have only the visual data here, but we don't have the numerical data. But if we imagine that we have the numerical data, it should be quite easy to answer this question because what are you going to do? You are going to just say, because the question is, everyone is clear about the question, which position is riskier? The short jet fuel position or the short spread position? You remember the spread? Alright, so the question is whether the short spread position is riskier or the short jet fuel position is riskier? Okay, so the answer should be very easy in terms of process. Think of the process. So you are saying short jet. You are also agreeing with the function. The short jet fuel is here. Yes, but you are not agreeing. You think the short spread position is here? What is the answer that you have? The risk will be assessed according to the market. According to the market. So as you said in the last class, that when the underlying position is hedged by the extra position. Then there is no meaning of the underlying position. The underlying position hedged by the. So now that we have the crude oil long position, that is the hedge position. Yeah, yeah, hedge position. Yeah. So now if when we have the hedge position, then the underlying position has no value. No, it has no validity. The underlying position. Yeah, I mean it's being transformed because it's now a spread position. Yes, sir. Now we have a spread position. Yeah. So the underlying the uh, in a, any way the market moves for the underlying position, it is not affected to the underlying position. Now the only now we have to only see the hedge position. No, 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 you have not understood the question. I'm not see the question is see they have two options. The company has two options. They can either decide not to hedge at all, which means they stick with the short crude oil position, short jet fuel position, and they run their business. Okay? 
So whatever happens to the quota, they'll just live with it. Whatever happens to the jet fuel price, that's one option that they have. The other option that they have is that they can hedge it and move to a short spread position, where the spread is defined as JF minus CL. These are the two options. Okay. So it's always either or. I mean, so either you'll choose one option or the other option. Now, if the reason for choosing is just rich production, okay. If the criteria for choosing between the two options is only risk reduction, you just want to know which one will reduce my risk. Okay, that's all you're interested in. So, depending on this, you have a you have a fork in the road. You have two paths. Either you can be 100% hedged, or you can be 100% uh, unhedged. Okay. So, if you're 100% unhedged, then you're short the jet fuel market. And if you're 100% hedged, then you are short the spread. Yes. JF minus CL. Okay. So the only way, how do I take this decision? We are saying that the company is... Same question, it uh, comes to the same question. Whether your risk will be lowered, that means if you choose the one with the lower risk, your risk will be lowered. Yeah, which position is more risky? See, you have a choice between two positions, right? You have a choice between two positions, okay? You have a choice to remain short jet fuel and, or you have a choice to uh, leave that short jet fuel position and take up a short spread position. This is clear. These are the two choices we have. So we are asking, now we are asking this question of, and let's say that I'm going to decide this problem, I'm going to solve this decision problem by choosing the option which is less risky. Let's say I've already given you this guideline. That uh, as since you're a hedger, okay, what is the role of a hedger? The objective of a hedger is to reduce risk. Okay, so therefore you are going to. Is everyone clear about the decision problem? Yes, sir. You have a decision problem. You can either decide to remain 100% unhedged and stay short the jet fuel market, or you can decide to be 100% hedged, in which case you will become short the spread. Okay, you have two options. And I'm giving you a guideline that you are going to decide, you're going to make this decision by choosing the option which is less risky, which will leave you with less risk. Okay, you should choose that option which will leave you with less risk. Then it's the second option. Yeah, okay, so that's what you said. Because earlier you said that the crude oil jet, short jet fuel position is riskier. And so, you're, so what you're saying now is also consistent with what you said earlier. Okay? Is everyone clear about the question now? Is everyone clear about the question? And I've already given you a guideline for choosing the question. It's like it's like you have a diet coke and you have a coke. And I'm telling you, on one side you have a coke and you have one side you have a diet coke. And I'm telling you, you choose the one which has less calories. So you choose the diet coke because I've already told you how to choose. Is this clear? Is this kind of decision? So you can only have one of the cats. Either you have the coke or you have the diet coke. And since I've already given you a guideline that you choose the one which has less calories. So you will have to choose the diet coke. Is everyone clear about this? Okay, so now similarly I'm saying that this is the option that the company has and I'm telling you, you have to choose the option which will leave you with less risk. Your net risk should be reduced by whatever you do. Okay, so now the question is then if these are the, these are the guidelines and these are the circumstances, 100% unhedged or should they go 100% hedged? 100% hedge, right? Yeah, whatever volume they are going to buy for that year, okay? So 100% hedge, okay? But this is fine, everybody has answered, uh, got the right answer, let's say, okay? That is the right answer, but how would you, what is the process by you would determine, the, by which you would determine this answer? Yeah, so what did we say now, if you see production, Let's try and write this down so you can remember this logic. Again, remember always that uh, we are not so much, we are not so interested in getting the right answer, but we have to understand the right process. What is the process by which you come to the right answer? Okay. So I've already told you that you have to reduce risk. So let's say the objective is reduce risk. Okay. Risk is measured okay. 
Okay, let us just write it in loose terms. All right, so so just understand the logic of the decision making. That's very that's more important. Okay, so you want to choose the option that will leave you with less risk. Okay, and what are we saying? That risk is measured by volatility. Volatility can be proxied by standard deviation. Okay, so what are you going to do? Remember, you have the data. Now, volatility can be proxied. The standard deviation is just a statistical measure. If you have the data series, you can compute the standard deviation. Okay. So let's look at this now. So what are, what are you going to do in terms of process? You're going to line up the blue series. Okay, we imagine we have the numbers. We just line up the blue series in a column. Okay, and then you take the standard deviation of the blue series. And then you line up the green line, which is the imaginary green line which we have drawn, which is the blue line minus the red line. Okay, because that is the spread price. Are you following? The blue line minus the red line is the spread price. Okay, so we are going to then separately line up in, a, in the same spreadsheet. Another column we will line up the green line, which we are saying is blue line minus red line, which is the spread, the value of the spread. Okay, we will line up the spread. Obviously, for each, for every value of the blue line, we can also get a live value of the green of the spread position because we have the red line. Also, we can just do a minus and get that value. Okay, so. And then you line up the green line as well, the, the spread position, the prices for the spread, the spread prices, and here you have the general prices on in one column. You take the standard deviation of the two columns, okay, and you will find that the standard deviation, which is going to have lower standard deviation, which you think will have lower standard deviation. Visually, you can tell me. Visually, you look at the spread, which is the you can see the spread. You can imagine the green line being the blue line minus the red line, plotted as a separate green line on this chart. Okay, now imagine that you are taking the standard deviation of both the blue line and the green line, which will have lower standard deviation. Yes? Crude oil, no, crude oil is not even involved in this, actually, as such. We are only looking at jet fuel versus the spread. The spread will have lower volatility. You can check this for yourself by taking yeah. So the green line you will find. Okay, you can imagine. You can see it visually from here also. Just imagine that space between the blue line and the red line. Okay, that is the spread. That is the spread price. Okay, so if you imagine that you plot that, okay, on the same time scale as a separate green line, you will find, and then you will look at the numbers. You look at the actual numbers. You will find that the green line, the spread will have lower lower standard deviation. Okay, the spread will have lower standard deviation. So in these types of situations, for these types of spread like crude oil versus jet fuel, then soybean meal versus soybeans. Okay, those which are related products. Okay, typically the spread will have uh, a much uh, lower volatility, much lower standard deviation than any of the outright prices. So if you compare now, we have three time series we can see on this. We can see, you can imagine three. So we have the blue, the red, and then we have the green, which is the blue minus red. Okay. So if you line these up in columns, okay, and you take the standard deviation, you'll find that both the blue and the red, the standard deviation is much higher than that of the green line. That is the spread position. Okay. So this is the nature of spread position. That is why we make a distinction between outright. So you might wonder why are we making a distinction between outright position and spread position? Because so generally, see, generally the kind of spread we don't look at a spread between say jet fuel and dollar Swiss. Okay, so typically when we look at a spread position in the oil market, we would typically look at jet fuel versus crude oil. Okay, or gasoline versus crude oil, something like that. Okay, so those will be, there will be some relationship or soybean meal versus soybeans. Okay, so when you crush. When you crush soybeans, you can get soybean meal and soybean oil. Okay, when you take soybeans and you crush them, then you basically produce soybean meal and soybean oil. So you can look at the spread between the soybean price and the soybean meal price. 
So when we look at spread positions, these are normally taken as related positions. You don't do like as I said, Jet Fuel versus Dollar Swiss Bank. You don't do that kind of spread. That's normally not what we consider as a spread, uh, spread position. Okay. So there has to be some kind of relationship in general. Okay. So uh, so this is basically so so the point we are understanding here. The point of all this discussion is basically to uh, make you understand that in general. Okay. So first, be clear about the process. Okay. Because risk we said is volatility is volatility. Volatility is proxied by standardization. So to figure out if any particular, what is the risk level in a particular market, all you have to do is line up the prices in a column and take the standard deviation. Okay, that will give you a proxy for the how risky that market is. Okay, so generally outright positions will have higher. Uh, so here now we have to deduct marks for Dipakshu and uh, Giri. There's still too much talking going on. Okay, all right, guys. Now uh, who will keep the just keep the score? So we'll do the deduction. Score keep. There's too much talking going on. Okay, so is everyone clear about this now? So the learning that we have at the end of the day is that generally outright positions will be much more volatile and risky than spread. than spread positions. Where the spreads have some kind of reasonable, the spread is taken between two prices which are reasonably related to each other. Like jet fuel and crude oil. Yeah, this is basically why you have, this is how you hedge. And that's why if you go back to our original question, and so always remember the process, okay? How did you figure out which position? If you go back to my original question, that what should you do? Should you go 100% hedge or should you remain 100% unhedged? If 100% hedge, if I've already given you objective, your objective is to reduce your total risk. You have to, because remember you're a hedger. So your objective is to reduce your total risk. Okay. So if I've already given you that guideline, like, you choose the one which you choose the drink which has fewer calories. So the logic is so the decision is very clear. Okay, so here also I've given you a logic. I've given you a guideline. Do whatever you have to do. Whatever you do, make sure that your total risk is reduced. So therefore, in that case, you would choose the you would choose to be short the spread rather than be short get fuel. Is this clear? Because the spread will have lower sanitation than the. Uh, outright position. So the outright position is the short jet fuel position, okay, and the spread position is the position where you are short jet fuel and long crude oil, which means you are short the jet fuel crude oil spread. Is everyone following this so far? Yes. Okay. All right. So essentially, and then obviously you have to remember how to figure out which is this risky. You just take the standard deviation, which is a proxy for what we call volatility in markets, and that's a proxy for risk. Okay. All right. So, uh, so that so the idea is here that so the airline is always going to be better off uh, choosing to hedge and take on a spread position because the riskiness of the spread position is much less compared to the uh, original position of short crude oil. Okay. Let's go through the rest of the. <coughs> Okay, spread positions are a couple of other things that we need to be uh, in a couple of terms which we want to know. Okay, is uh, is the font? Yeah, I can see it. So no point ask. No need to ask you guys. Okay, uh, you can learn these other terms. Essentially, we are looking at two types of spreads. One is an intra-market spread, and one is an inter-market spread. Okay, so what you saw? What's an example of an inter-market spread? Is what you just saw. The jet fuel minus uh, jet fuel minus crude oil. That's an example of an inter-market spread. Okay, so uh, so they're basically the uh, outright positions are two different markets, and then you take the difference between the two. Intra-market spread is let's look at this distribution of. You remember the distribution that we looked at of oil futures prices. Thank <laughs> you. 
what is this? Okay, this is actually the wrong hyperlink because Okay, get familiar with this website in case we are able to trade on the TWS. As I said, there's a lot of good information on this website. You can learn a lot about futures trading by getting on this website and uh, exploring. They have this education uh, part here. Okay, so let's look at uh, crude oil futures. Okay guys, now this is a long, long time, it took us a long time to get this chart, uh, this page loaded up because I had actually put in the wrong hyperlink. Okay, so this is a distribution of, again, we have more talking going on now, Mittal and Giri and uh, who is this whole, uh, this triangular com combination, who is next to Akshit? Akshit and, Akshit is in the same group? No one is talking. How, how is that possible? You are just looking at each other. Okay, uh, just note down Akshit, uh, Akshit, Giri and Mittal. This is a good, Giri is second time, yeah. Yeah, you can write Giri as minus 4, then I will figure it out. And then write uh, Akshit and uh, Mittal. Okay, guys, now let's come back to this. It took us a long time to load this uh, page of... Um, <laughs> Okay, what were we discussing? We were discussing the concept of a intra-market spread. Inter-market spread you already understood? Oil. Jet fuel minus crude oil is an example of an inter-market spread. You understand the difference between inter and intra? Yes, sir. Okay. Inter-varsity means different different universities competing against each other. Intra-varsity means all of all colleges within Delhi University. Okay, within one university. So same way. Different so intermarket is between two different markets okay when one is a jet fuel market and one is a crude oil market and then you take the spread between the two that's an intermarket spread is that clear okay now we are looking at an intra market spread within one market so the same market is crude oil okay essentially crude oil futures if you take a market instrument combination and let's look at this now so this is you have seen this earlier on the bar chart page okay so you can see all the different months, the different delivery months for crude oil and you can see all the different prices for the different months. 
Okay, let's do a recap. Let's do a recap of the uh, of the um, of what we discussed earlier. So Nakpal, if this is this crude oil futures curve, is it in backwardation or contango? Why is it backward? That is, I heard. <laughs> Are you telling you that it is backwardation? Why is it backwardation? Now for that also you would ask him. Why is it backwardation? Yes, Navita, tell us why is it backwardation? Is it backwardation in the first place? Is it backwardation? Are you hearing these terms for the first time? Yes, sir. Navita, first time. Why? Haven't I discussed this in the class? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, were you were absent. So, you, but you have to listen to those. Uh, the class is there either in audio or video form. So you have to catch up, right? Okay. Who will answer? Who will middle? Is this in backwardation or contango? It's in contango. Why? No, Gunjan, what is it? Backwardation or contango? Backwardation, why? Okay, good. So that is the kind of answer we want, right? So it is backwardation because she is noticing the pattern also. The pattern is that the curve is inverted. Okay, it's not a normal curve. The curve is inverted. So you can see prices are for future, uh, the further forward you go, the lower the price. Okay, so the curve is inverted. If you plot this as a, as a, if you plot this, uh, if you plot this thing, okay, if you plot this data, okay, so you put November, December, January, uh, February, January 2019, February 2019, okay, if you plot all this data, and then you plot the prices, 76.25, 76.10, 75.96, all this, it's an inverted curve, and so, so her answer is correct. It is backwardation because. When the, when the curve is inverted, we say it's backwardation, and then when it's uh, a normal curve, a full sloping curve, we say it's contango. Okay? Alright. So, Nikhil, this is uh, if you plot this, okay? If you put all those, uh, the first column, November 2018, December 2018, Jan 2019, and then you take the uh, fourth column, that is the last price, 76.25, 76.09, 75.96. If you plot this, would that be a time series plot or would that be a cross sectional data chart? Cross sectional. Cross sectional, why? Okay, Kanika. Is it cross sectional? Is my question clear? If you plot, if you plot, uh, you understood my question. And you're saying it's actually time series. Why? It's, it's plotted for different time periods. Okay. No, but this, what is the typical? Okay, look at that for the chart on your left. Okay, this is your what chart is that? That is the S and P 500 chart. Is it the? Uh, oh, that's a that's a futures contract actually. The E mini futures contract. Is that chart a time series chart or a cross sectional data chart? No, I'm asking Karika. That's a time series. But what is being shown? How many variables are on that chart? How many variables are on that chart? No, no, how many variables? 1, 2, 3, 5, 9, huh? 1. Okay, and how many variables are on this chart? 1. And how many time periods are on this chart? 1 or more than 1? More than 1. And how many time periods are on this chart here on the, uh, when we look at the future curve? More than 1. Yes, yes, Arjun. This is a cross sectional yeah. uh, data series because uh, they are different variables at a point of time. This is a future price for different periods of time. So basically, uh, all these states are different variables, but for a future price at a point of time, and when we change the point of time, when these prices will change. So these are different variables. Okay. So that is the correct answer. Okay. 
So this is, so remember, so you are just testing, we see that, okay? At least what we have to make sure that when you graduate from an MBA program with a finance specialization, all these fundamentals should be crystal clear. There should be no doubt in your head about any kind of any of these fundamentals. But what we are finding is many people are not clear about these basic questions, okay? So you should be able to quickly answer. So if you look at the S&P 500 chart, that is a time series data chart. Because you have one variable and it is plotted for multiple periods of time. I can't see what the year is, but obviously the latest period is today. And that looks like it's probably uh, from the middle of last year. From, it looks like from, from what I can see from the picture. It looks like the middle of last year. The drop is basically the drop in early January that we had today, in exactly. this year. Yeah, so that is probably around the middle of 2017. So that data range is from the middle of 2017 roughly towards to today. Okay, and that's just one variable. That's a time series chart on the left of the projector screen because it's one variable and it's plotted for multiple periods of time. It's like if I take Weber's temperature today and then every day I take this temperature and then I make a plot. That temperature today, temperature tomorrow, temperature day after, etc., etc., and then we make, put that as a chart. That would be a time series data chart. There is only one variable that is Weber's temperature. Okay, and it is plotted at multiple periods of time. That's a time series data chart. This, as Archul correctly explained on the projector screen, this is actually a, so all of you guys, uh, Kanika, uh, Nakpal, Nikhil, all of you guys, please make sure you understand the logic. This is a cross-section of data chart, okay? This is just like a yield curve or a implied volatility term structure. This is a cross-section of data chart because each of those contract prices are different. The reason those prices are different is because the settlement dates are all different, okay? The delivery dates are all different. That one is in November 2018, one is in February 2019, one is March 2019. So these are all different variables for our purposes. Okay, because they will all move differently. The prices are also different and they will all move differently. Okay, so these are different variables. You are taking a snapshot. Now if I take everybody's, snap, everybody's temperature in this class and I record it as temperature at 4.15 p.m. on Thursday and I show everybody's temperature, that would be cross-sectional data. Is this clear? Because everybody's temperature, different variables, so we have 58 different variables. Okay, of course there's so many absences, so we have only 25 variables maybe. Okay, but that's all at a time, point of time, the snapshot at a point of time, that would be cross-sectional data. So this is an example of cross-sectional data because we are taking a snapshot. As you can see, these prices are changing. So every time the price changes, you've got a different snapshot actually. Okay, because the time period is different also, the point of time is different. Okay, so that was just about recaps. What were we talking about? So we made a little bit of a detour, we went into a detour to make sure that people are uh, clear about the concepts that have already been covered. So we were talking about intra-market spreads, okay? So the market here, intra-market means within the same market. The market is the same, it's crude oil, okay? And in particular the instrument is, the market instrument part, part combination is, crude oil futures, and West Texas Intermediate crude oil futures. And now we're talking about intra-market spread. So now if I do, if I put on a position, let's say, where I'm long, you're always allowed to do this, okay? If I buy November and I sell February, okay? One of the things you can do is you can independently buy November contracts, okay? No one's gonna stop you. You can independently also buy February contracts, Feb 2019. And you can also independently buy November and sell February. Okay? So this is also another op option that is available. So if you did this last one, which is buy November, sell February, that will create a... So first let's take the, again, let's go back to the example uh, contrasting between the outright position and the spread position. If you did the first one, which is buy November, okay, that's an outright position. Only buy November. Separately, if you do only sell February 2019, that's also an outright position, outright short position in this case. But if you combine the two, then if you buy simultaneously, you buy November and sell February. Now you have a spread position. You no longer have an outright position, you have a spread position. Okay? So typically this will have, again, it will have the same characteristics of spread position, which means now if you look at the spread position and how, how much the value of the spread position changes, it will move much less than either of the outright positions. Okay, so if you look at the volatility of crude oil prices, okay, it will be kind of the same. If we, we have actually moved away from that. So 
Okay, so that chart is far away, so I don't want to go there again, but the point is, is everyone clear about this? Remember, we already discussed this earlier, right? So if you independently buy November or independently sell February, in both cases you will have outright positions, okay? And those outright positions will have a volatility which will be much higher, okay? Either for long November or for short February. The volatility of those positions, the risk of those positions will be much higher uh, than if you put on a spread position. That is long, long November, short February. That spread position, the risk of that spread position is much less because the spread will move much less. If you plot it over time, okay, you will see that the spread will move much less. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why people have spread positions. They also have in many of the commodity markets because there is a question of actual delivery in the grain markets. You have to deal with the harvest time. You can't just harvest wheat whenever you want. There is a season for harvesting wheat. So because of these uh, mismatches in supply. People have these kind of positions, okay? But these are spread positions, so they are much less risky than outright positions. Is everyone clear now? So we have covered spread positions, outright positions, the difference in the risk levels, okay? And how to determine whether you're long or short or spread, and then how to determine your position in any particular market. This, that's a recap, okay? And then uh, we are looking at intra market versus inter market spreads, okay? All right, so let's quickly go on and try to cover more material because we have to. All right, let's see. This stuff you guys have already covered, okay? Risk definitions, okay. This you can just cap or uh, just do this on your own. I think this part we can cover a little bit later because it's not so important. Just do the reading on your own. I mean, it's not important in the sense it is important, but it doesn't directly uh, affect our project. So we can skip it. I want to just make sure that I get you started on the project. Um, This also we can do later. Okay, underlying position we have already covered. Okay, you understand now what is an underlying position? Okay, this is important because this is part, this is your first question. Okay, key risk factors. Okay, it's a very complicated term, but actually it's very simple. If you go back to the balance sheet, okay, so essentially the key risk factor is any kind of market price which affects your balance sheet value. You already saw how the balance sheet was changing. When I changed the gold price, the balance sheet value was changing. Okay? So any kind of any market price. So the key risk factor typically will be a market price. Okay? That is basically which is any market price which is going to affect the value of your uh, your balance sheet. Okay? Net worth. Sorry? Net worth. net worth will be affected. Okay? Your net worth will be affected. So essentially you can see the definition here. Okay, so KRF is associated with the KRF market and instrument combination. Okay, which is what I told you. Market instrument combination, you already saw the example. We just looked at the crude oil futures curve. That there the market instrument combination is crude oil is the market. West Texas Intermediate crude oil in particular is the market. Okay, and the instrument is futures. Okay, so the market, typically whenever you look at a market, remember that when we looked at our asset class market instrument taxonomy, Whenever you see a market, you will always see it in some instrument form or the other, in the form of some instrument or the other. Like when you're looking at foreign exchange here, you're looking at these foreign exchange prices. These are all spot foreign exchange. Okay. So whenever you see a market price, it is always the price of some instrument. Okay. So it is the price of, so it is some kind of market instrument combination. Either you look at a futures price or a spot price or something. Okay. So. You cannot see the market without having some kind of instrument uh, that you're looking at. Okay, uh, so the KRF essentially is, so the KRF is essentially, we'll, we'll see what the KRF is, that's what it is essentially, okay, the key risk factor, okay, hedge transaction and hedge position. Okay, this is just a matter of a little bit of, uh, just to be careful about terminology, we'll just go through this quickly. So. Hedge transaction, if you go back to the example of the airline that we discussed, okay, so the natural position of the airline was short jet fuel, okay, 
So that they put on later. Okay, so the natural position is short jet fuel, and then they put on, they decided to hedge, and so they did a, so we are going to make a distinction, we are being very particular about the use of words. Okay, so we want to make a distinction between hedge transaction and hedge position. So when they put on that crude oil futures hedge, the hedge transaction that they did was buying futures, buying crude oil futures. Okay, buy crude oil futures is a hedge transaction. And then the hedge position that you have is long crude oil futures. Okay, so to buy is essentially the hedge, hedge uh, if you see sale and US, then read the notes here. Just read the notes here while I give my voice a bit of rest. Just read the notes. This is just, just to be particular about the use of words, okay? So, say, because I've noticed many people are not particular about the use of words, okay? Most of you are not particular about the use of words. So, we have to be very particular. Hedge to buy or to sell is a transaction, okay? That you buy, you, are, you have a sale of US dollars, purchase of CHF, that's a transaction. And the position that you end up with is short US dollars or long US, long Swiss, okay? So, that's what we mean by these two distinctions. Uh, this, this particular distinction, hedge transaction, Basis risk we have already covered. I think we have covered most of the types of hedging programs we can come to later. Um, okay, and this is the decision problems we'll come to. Um, we can do this. Okay, let's let's uh, let's spend a little bit of time on the spread on the balance sheet so that you know the position that you have. Okay, what is the underlying position now for this company? Go back to the balance sheet. Is everyone, ha anyone having any problems with this case? Understanding this case? You are able to understand clearly? Okay, so what you will find in this case, uh, we will have to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, it will take a lot of time to cover. We will have to spend several sessions on this case. So, uh, but in the past, I think most of the cases you would have done, you would have finished it in one or two sessions, right? But here we'll have to spend a lot of time on it. So let's quickly test our concepts, our ability to understand the concepts. So what is Magma's underlying position with respect to gold? Long, everyone is clear, Pranav? What is it? Long? Why is it long? What is the logic we just gave you? How do, how do you answer these questions? Why is it long? Why is it short? Or even how do you come up with your answer? There's a process to be followed. Yeah? Yes, Chabra? Why is it long? When it is in the block method, I would be getting the earnings of the earnings of the earnings of the earnings of the Yeah, okay, so perhaps that is the logic you have to use. That you know that you already done this exercise yesterday. That when the price, in this case, you know that if you increase the price of gold, you will earn a profit because you have gold inventories, okay, the value of your inventory will go up. And then if the price of gold drops, you will have a loss. So what kind of, then you ask yourself, what kind of position behaves in this way? That when the market price goes up, you make a profit, and when the market price drops, you make you make a loss. So it's a long position that we have. So remember the logic, because if you try to just mug up things, you'll forget. But if you remember the concept and the logic, you'll never forget it in your life. You agree or not? Yes. Okay. So similarly, what is the underlying position in gold? Sorry, we started with gold. In copper? But we are coming to that. So in copper? Also long? Okay, so if we increase the copper price, okay, it will increase the value of the inventories. Okay, I hope everybody is clear about the, we did some testing of the accounting concepts also yesterday. I hope everybody is clear about that. Okay, the net worth is a residual. Okay, so net worth is your total as total assets minus outside liabilities. Outside liabilities is all forms of debt. Okay, so you can't change the value of your debt. You can't tell your bank that uh, you know my inventories have dropped in value. Please reduce your loan amount. Okay, you can't tell them that. So that remains fixed. So if you make a profit, you get a larger residual. If you make a loss, you have uh, a, I mean basically you have a loss. Your net worth goes down because you can't change the outside liabilities. Okay, everyone's clear about the residual part. Okay. So oil, what is the underlying position in oil? Long. Okay, down here. Okay, now let's come to the underlying uh, for the uh, for the dollar yen. Short dollar yen. We are short dollar yen. Okay, so let's test it. 
So, okay, so Sahil is saying we are short dollar yet. Okay. Okay, so first remember the concept of the KRF market. Okay, now again, here what is going on, there's another, just go another direction. Middle and Kola and Solangi. It's <laughs> right now, minus six. You just, yeah, whatever, middle is minus six. The middle, the Kola and Solangi, just write down the thing. That's okay, that I'll figure out later. You write the names, the three names together. So the first round was Akshin, and, uh, sorry, Giri and Vipakshi. The second round was Giri and Giri and Akshit and Middle. Just write down the names like that. First you write Giri and Vipakshu. Then you write Giri uh, and Akshit, uh, Giri and Akshit and Middle. Then third round, third row you write uh, Middle and Solanki and Bola. <laughs> okay. So now the question is, what is the position? Okay. What is the position in dollar yen? Okay. So first let's understand. Okay. Let's apply the concept of the key risk factors. One of your questions in the case is, what are the key risk factors? Okay. So let me just, here I'll just help you out. Here what we will say is that the key risk factors here are the spot gold price. Okay. The spot copper price. We are taking a spot copper. We can look at copper futures also if we do. You can take it as futures part, futures prices also if we do the project on PWS, it will not make much of a difference. Here we we'll, because we are assuming still we are doing it on Oanda, so we are going to take this as spot prices. So spot gold prices is your KRF, is a key risk factor, okay. Then the copper, spot copper price is a key risk factor and the spot oil price is a key risk factor, okay. This is how we talk about key risk factors. Key risk factor essentially is nothing but some market price which is going to affect the value of your balance sheet, okay. But we want to be familiar with this term. Okay. So here, when you come to the liability side, in the case of these, what you have on the liability side, the particular things that should concern you. Remember, we said that you have to be aware of that this particular balance sheet is in U.S. dollars. So you have to be always aware in corporate risk management. You have to be always aware of your balance sheet currency. In this case, your balance sheet currency is U.S. dollars. Okay. So the moment you're looking at the liability side. If you have a dollar loan, then you are not so worried, okay? Then you have to again look at it whether it is fixed rate or floating rate. But per se, a dollar loan at a first level is not a concern. But the moment you see liabilities, you are a dollar balance sheet person, and you look at liabilities and you see yen loan, Aussie loan, immediately there is a red flag, okay? Because you have a risk, you have a currency risk. Because those there is a currency mismatch. You have loans, and remember your revenues are also all in US dollars. Your revenues are also in US dollars, that information is given in the case. The revenues are all in US dollars. If you have revenues in US dollars, but you have liabilities in yen and Aussie, okay, that should immediately be a red flag that you have a risk there. You have a currency exposure, okay. So, therefore, you are in particular what we will say here, the continuing with the concept of key risk factors, your spot dollar yen rate, actually, it will be a formal dollar yen rate because when the loan matures, but we, for the purposes of simplicity, we will take it as a Spot dollar yen rate, okay, and we'll keep holding the position. So, dollar yen FX rate is a concern that will be a key risk factor, okay. We explain uh, is everyone clear about that yes. because you have a dollar balance sheet, you have dollar revenues, and you have loans in yen, okay. So, therefore, the dollar yen exchange rate is a problem, okay. So, that's a so here we'll say that the dollar yen rate will take it as a spot rate, the dollar yen spot rate is a key risk factor. Okay. Similarly, the Aussie US spot rate is also a key risk factor because you have a dollar re you have dollar revenues and you have an Aussie dollar loan. Okay. So if the Aussie dollar appreciates, then you'll have a problem. Okay. So because your liabilities will go. So now, therefore, another key risk factor is the Aussie dollar US dollar. Okay. So like, but since we are going with the key risk factors, let's also identify the last one. Is there any other key risk factor that we have left out? So far, we identified three on the asset side. We have identified two on the liability side. From the information in the case, is there any other risk factor that we have left out? Yeah. So floating rate. So what does it say in the case that the US dollar loan of 15 million that is at three month LIBOR? Three month LIBOR is a floating rate or a fixed rate? Floating rate. Okay. So that after three months again the new rate you don't know what it's going to be today. That will be? Yeah. So again your last risk factor in this case is the last key risk factor is three month LIBOR. 
Three months by one because the rate is the interest rate is fixing uh, it's fix, refixing at three months every three months. So the three month LIBOR interest rate is another key risk factor. Is this clear? Okay. You are exposed because if the if the three month LIBOR rate keeps moving up, okay, it's going to create problems because your interest liabilities will keep increasing. So the last key risk factor that we have to be concerned with is three month LIBOR. Three month in particular three month US dollar LIBOR. Okay, this is how you have to say it because you can also have three months sterling LIBOR that we are not bothered about. We are concerned with three month US dollar LIBOR. Okay, essentially, basically offshore interest rates in three month, for three months in US dollars. That's what LIBOR is. Okay, in the offshore dollar market, the three month rate for borrowing three month dollars. That's three month dollar LIBOR. Okay. Okay, so those are your risk factors. So how many do we have? One, two, three on this side. One, two, three on this side. Yeah. Forward, I said forward dollar dollar yen rate, depending on whenever the load is maturing. But spot. Yeah, we are just going to take it as spot for the sake of simplification because that FX swaps we have not yet covered. So we'll keep it as spot. So is everyone clear about the concept of key risk factors? So the key risk factors helps you to focus in risk management. When you have to manage treasury risk, you will basically identify the key risk factors. First you'll identify the underlying conditions. Okay, then you'll identify the key risk factors. And those are the markets where you have to focus on. So the key risk factor means if the spot gold is a key risk factor, then you start focusing on the spot gold market and tracking the price movement to make sure that you manage it properly. Okay. So this is how is everyone following the framework? Okay. Now, yes. What? No, there's an alarm. Don't worry. The alarm will go off. Now be disciplined. Be disciplined and try to because I need to get you started on the get you ready for practice. Let's do this. Now, what is the underlying position in, in dollar yen? So first we have identified already that dollar yen rate is an exchange rate is a key risk factor. Yes. Okay, so now let's look at what is the underlying position for magma in dollar yen. Are we looking either long or short? There are only one or the two. Yes, what is it long or short? Somebody said something, Sahil said something. You said long. You said short. Dollar yen, you said short. Okay, let's test Sahil's view. So if Sahil is correct, if dollar yen we are short, that means if I increase the dollar yen price, you should lose money. Yes, yes. Okay, let's see the sign is correct. Okay, I'm going to increase this price. Watch the watch the column uh, I I six market value in U.S. dollars. Okay, so I'm going to make this 120. So the dollar yen rate is climbing. What happened to the market value? Did it go up or down? What up? It went down. What happened to the market value? It was 13 something. Right? What? One minute. One minute. I asked you to focus on cell number I7. I7, I don't know if you guys can see at the back I7. Essentially market value in US dollars for the yen loan. It was 13 something. Let's do it again. You want to do it again? Yes. What happened here? How did this come to be 120? Oh, sorry. I did control Y. Control Z. Okay, guys. Now notice this 13.2. Yes. Okay. The rate is 13.45 is 13.2 is the market value. I'm changing it to 120 now. Dollar yen is rising from 113 to 120. What happens to the market value? It goes down. Okay. So one minute. We are testing Sahil's uh, assertion that the underlying position is short dollar yen. So if he's correct, then if the dollar yen rate rises, he should lose money. Okay. What happened to the market value of your dollar dollar value? Remember, this is a dollar value sheet. So the dollar value of your liabilities has gone down. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? If the dollar value of your liabilities, remember, you're earning in dollars. Okay. So if I have a student, if I have a student loan which is at uh, okay, whatever the dollar value of my student loan. If the loan, if I'm earning in dollars and I have a certain student loan, if the dollar value of my loan goes down. Isn't it better for me? Yes, sir. It's good for me. It's like making a profit. Yes, sir. Okay. So then, Sahil's statement is not correct. 
because we raised the market price. We raised the market price. He said we were short the market. We raised the market price and we found that we are actually making money. Is there ever an agreement or not? What is what did science say? Science said we have stock short dollar yen. We identified dollar yen as a key risk factor. And he said that so then obviously we have to also be aware what is our underlying position. We need to be aware of our underlying position, otherwise, how would we know which way to hedge? So his his statement was our underlying position is short dollar yen. So to test his position, we what did we do? The rate was 130, 20, whatever, 45. We increase the rate. Okay, so if, if he was right, then when the market price goes up, here yeah, the market price went up from 130, 45 to 120, then we should have lost money. Yes, if his statement was correct, but actually we are making money yes. because the dollar value of the liability has fallen. Yes. Okay, so we are making money. Yes. So that means what must be the position? No. If the rate goes up and we are making money, no. then we must be long. No. Okay, okay, think about it intuitively also. What is happening here? Dollar yen. When the dollar yen rate drops, what is happening? See, actually, dollar yen is okay. As the dollar yen rate is rising here on the right hand side of the chart, what is happening? The yen is strengthening or weakening? The yen is weakening, okay. So yen is weakening and your loan is in yen. So if you have taken a loan in yen and the yen is weakening, that should be logically also should be good for you. Because your earnings are in US dollars. Your earnings are in US dollars and you have taken a loan in yen. After you take the loan, the yen starts weakening in dollar terms. Then it is good for you. Logically also, intuitively also it should make sense. Okay? Alright? But you can always do it mechanically, but you should understand it at both levels. The best way to do it mechanically is to do what we did earlier. Take the price and increase the price and see if you make money or lose money. That's a foolproof way of understanding it. But you should also understand it intuitively. In the first part of the chart, when the dollar yen is falling from 130 to 110, on the first on the left hand side of the chart, okay, from July July onwards, mid early July, uh, mid July, when it is falling from 130 to 110. At that point, what is happening? The yen is strengthening or weakening? Strengthening. strengthening. Okay. Now that is a concern. If you have a liability in yen and you are earning in dollars, and the yen is strengthening against the dollar, then it's a problem. You are losing money. Losing money. Is this clear? That means you are long. Essentially, is everyone clear about this? Okay. So similarly, think about it intuitively. Let's go back to the Aussie dollar. What is your position in Aussie spot Aussie? Spot Aussie means AUD USD. Okay. So what is your position in Oxford Aussie? Long. Long? Okay, let's test it. Who's saying we are saying long? <laughs> she doesn't want to be caught. Now one sec. Who is long or short? Okay, let's test long. If it's not long, then it must be short. Yes, sir. Okay, so if we are long, then we are going to I'm going to reduce the price. I'm going to reduce the price and then note the dollar value of the liability is 14.4 14.5 okay i'm going to reduce the price you said we are long right so let me make it 60. what happened one minute let's go step by step don't jump so did the dollar value of the liability go down or one minute, one minute. we'll finish the discussion now okay we'll finish the discussion so you know your positions okay one minute one sec what happened to the dollar value of the liabilities? It went down. Yes, sir. That means it's good for you or bad for you? Good for, good for you. Good for it's you. like making a profit. Yes. And what did we do to the rate? Yes. The rate dropped. Yes. So the market price fell and it, you made a profit. Short, short. That means your position is short. 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 Okay? Clear? You're short Aussie. Again, if you demand, remember. So you're, in this case, your underlying position, so this is important to understand that the underlying position in the Aussie is short in the dollar yen is long so you should be clear about the logic okay how to figure out the logic uh, how to how to apply the logic and figure out where your underlying position is okay so we'll come to the dollar LIBOR anyway we can't manage LIBOR risk on on wind up so now you have to start thinking because your project will start within, within a, a couple of weeks okay now you have to figure out the logic you have to start doing the opposite remember you have to hedge this balance sheet dynamically hedge the balance sheet 
prices will keep moving on. Now you know your underlying positions. Yes. Okay. So you are long all these commodities. That means your hedge positions will always have to be. Remember the hedger. What is the hedger's first position? First transaction. Total risk has to go down. Yes. So you can't buy. Your first position can't be buying because you are already long one ten thousand ounces. So you can't buy. Your first position, first transaction has to be sell. If you sell five thousand ounces, then you can buy back two thousand ounces later. But initially you have to sell, so your net position cannot be over the existing position. So we'll continue with this, but start practicing already. Okay? Now you know what you have to do. You know your positions. You know your underlying positions. Okay? And you know the markets that you have to follow. Okay? So start practicing already. What you have to Yes. Sir, we have created two IDs on TWS. Why two? Why not three? We have created three IDs. I told you to make three IDs. No? And one on one now. One on one. One on one does fine. One on one does fine.